Woof. <laughs> well, I'm greatly honored to be here. Thank you, Kenny and Nina, and thank you all, Bioneers. It really feels like I've come home. I really have some groundbreaking new research, never been revealed to an audience like this, only in the past several weeks, and I'm going to reveal at the end of my talk. Now, I'd like to start out my talk because I'm wearing my favorite hat. It's a very cool hat, <laughs> made from the Amadou mushroom. It's a bir birch polypore mushroom. This hat is actually made by some ladies in Transylvania. It allowed for the portability of fire. And you can hollow, the embers, uh, hollow this mushroom out, put embers of fire inside, and carry fire for days. There is no doubt that we all are Africans. We migrated north into Europe. We discovered something new called winter. Oops. <laughs> this, this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. Now, this mushroom goes back medicinally uh, also thousands of years. Hippocrates first described it in 450 BCE as an anti-inflammatory. Beekeepers throughout Europe use this for smoking bees. This mushroom in the 1960s was the first mushroom to contain an antiviral substance that was known to medicine. Well, this mushroom is an example of the thread of knowledge going back to our ancestors when we were once forest people. Not long ago, we were so dependent upon the forests, and deforestation, I think, is the greatest threat to human survival today. Now I'm going to show another friend of mine. <laughs> this is Agaricon. Agaricon was first described by Dioscorides in 65 AD as Elixirium ad longum vitum, the elixir of long life. As a resident exclusively of the old growth forest in Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, Northern California, now thought to be extinct throughout most of Europe because of deforestation. I believe and I want to propose to you that Agaricon, like Amadou, will be extremely significant for human survival. We have now entered into 6X, the greatest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet. But this extinction event is not caused by an asteroid impact, or volcanoes, or earthquakes. It's caused by an organism, by us. Not only are we the cause of this extinction event, but we're likely to be its victim. Deforestation is causing zoonotic diseases to spread. And the emergence of Ebola is directly related to deforestation and a clash of the cultural clash, so to speak, between bats and humans. This is something that I think is emblematic of the times. When an ecosystem exceeds, when an organism exceeds the carrying capacity of its ecosystem, then disease vectors emanate. This is the way of nature. So, as Kenny mentioned, I'm greatly honored to be the Invention Ambassador for AAAS. I carry this honor for all of us. I mean, one of us, one of our tribe, is being recognized by the most prestigious scientific organization in the world. So, uh, thank all of you. Now, my brother John uh, really inspired me to get into science. He went to Yale. We had a beautiful laboratory in the basement when I was a kid, but he never let me get in there because I was the youngest son. You know, and he... Uh, always, he was my mentor, but he was always kind of like competitive to me. He never really believed that this, science, this mushroom science stuff was all that important. So when this award was announced, I was, I was vetted by scientists. And I, so I was really eager to call my brother John. I called and there's no answer. And so I emailed him on June 9th uh, when the award was announced. On June 9th, that is the day that they discovered my brother John's body. He never got the email. So this talk is, is dedicated to him. So, um, so we spend a lot of time in the old growth forests. And in these forests, I believe, are libraries of knowledge. Ancestrally, it goes back not only millennia, but multidimensionally in ways that we can barely imagine. The largest <laughs> organism in the world is a fungus in eastern Oregon. It is a mushroom, a honey mushroom, uh, called Armillaria astoii. It covers 2,200 acres. It's a contiguous mycelial mat, and it's only one cell wall thick. Well, think of that. The forests are being governed and controlled by these large fungal mats, and I think we should respect things that are larger than us, especially the largest organism in the world, don't you think? And the mycelium of these saprophytic fungi in particular are the grand molecular disassemblers of nature. They're soil magicians. They're tenacious. They can hold tens of thousands times their weight. They can hold the soil together, preventing erosion. And then they, when they stream out and grow, cro course habitats, they control the dissension 
of subsequent microorganisms that populate the uh, downstream communities that give rise to the, to the plants and the forest that create the debris, debris fields that then feed the fungal descendants. They're purposeful in their choosing of uh, microbial allies, and they're commensal. The mycelium is an extended you know, uh, stomach. It's a, they're externalized lungs, and I believe that th these are externalized neurological networks and part of the, the Earth's natural internet that is in constant biomolecular communication governing the ecosystem. The mycelium expresses these little extracellular droplets in which are acids, enzymes, all sorts of messaging molecules, many, many compounds um, that are, scientists are still discovering that are unique, at least unique to us. And the mycelium it transports thousands of nuclei. This is a movie by my friend Patrick Hickey. And these bundles of nuclei stream across the networks. And because of epigenesis and the resorting of nuclei at the tips, literally hundreds of millions of tips of mycelium at, in a swath the size of the stretch of my arms, if there's a new insect, a new toxin, a new food source, if there's a reassortment of nuclei, an expression of a new enzyme, a new acid, a new solution to digesting that toxin, what happens? The mycelium becomes educated, it then captures that new nutrition, and that information genetically becomes resident within the entire mycelial mat. These are self-learning membranes. Virtually all plants, more than 90% of plants, have mycorrhizal fungi that extend the root zones hundreds of times, giving them the essential nutrients. And the use of fertilizers now in factory farms defeat the mycorrhizal networks and make them addicted as if a, a, as if a plant becomes addicted like a drug addict. So the, depending upon these natural e ecological systems is far better. This resource study came out <clears throat> just a few months ago, and um, it's surprising that this study just recently came out. Six bean plants were individually put into different pots. The first bean plant was exposed to aphids. Aphid, the plants then produced alkaloids that are anti-aphid. And the, uh, the, the first plant that was exposed, the five other plants did not. When the six plants were joined together in the common soil by, and, and connected by the mycelial networks, when the first plant was exposed to aphids, all the other five plants also produced the anti-aphid alkaloids thus proving that the root system had a communication pathway to help it, uh, alert and defend the community from potential pathogens. So Dusty and I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. This is where we go, and this is where I say I go to church on Sundays. Well, Agaricon, as I mentioned, is a species of great significance. Some of you have heard my previous talks working with the BioShield Biodefense Program. Over 700 samples were submitted, and these are the positive drug control Anything that's over two is considered to be active as an antiviral. And then we submitted 700 samples, uh, all coded. The US government did not know what the samples were. And compared to our antiviral control, this is the, the activity uh, antivirally of our extracts diluted 100 to 1 from the mycelium. They, uh, they show no toxicity to human cells, but high selectivity ag against viruses including H5N and bird flu, as well as herpes simplex one and two. The, um, I'll do that again. So, this is my manly man picture. <laughs> <laughs> but not, not long ago, our, our forests of, our, of the world had enormous amounts of wood debris. Unfortunately now, uh, the wood debris has been taken out of the forest and now, with our current practices, we have a small fraction of the resident wood debris that was otherwise in nature that depend, organisms depended upon and through which we've evolved through the threat of evolution uh, to where we are today. Now we are removing that menu of wood debris from the ecosystem. Organisms that are dependent upon it for millions of years, what do they do? So I want to bring to you to, uh, to an epiphany that I've had that I think is just truly revolutionary. This is a photograph from Whole Foods, thank you Whole Foods, and a presidential memorandum that came out a few months ago from President Obama talking about the stressors that are leading to colony collapse disorders, I use the word in plural, and the loss of, uh, of poor nu bee nutrition, the loss of forage lands, parasites from mites that uh, are carrying viruses, and the exposure to pesticides. These are all unfortunately multiple stressors which are combining at once to cause the bees to be uh, harmed. I am going to show you a short movie now by my good friend Louis Schwartzberg that talks of, that shows how the bees forage. They forage several uh, miles away from the um, from their habitat. If we could have the movie forward, and the bees leave these hives 
and then they don't come back. Now, worker bees are, they live only seven to 10 days at the end of their life when they're foraging. So when you see bees on, on flowers, that's the last week or so of their life. But upon hatching, the, the young bees then quickly become nurse bees and they take care of the brood. Well, when there is a loss of, of foraging bees, the nurse bees then are prematurely recruited and they, as a result, the, the nurse bees, their population declines, the brood is not taken care of, mites and other diseases then begin to spiral out of control and suddenly the whole colony collapses. So follow me on this path. I have had a very bizarre set of circumstances. Dusty and I are hiking in the old growth forest, forest in the Olympic National Forest, the South Fork of the Ho. We go around a corner and Dusty sees this incredible bear scratch. Bam! It pulls, it pulls, it scratches the tree and bears scratch trees. Well, bears scratch trees um, for the resin. I think a lot of people know that. And we came back two or three years later and this is the entry wound for polypore mushrooms. So the Forest Service and the lumber industry hired hunters to kill thousands of bears because they were scratching the trees and hurting their timber interests. And then David Suzuki and others uh, uh, then found out that the bears were actually pulling salmon from the stream and bringing sea phosphorus back into the forest ecosystem, thus allowing the trees to grow larger. Humans are so adept at choosing exactly opposite of their best interests. <laughs> so we went to this tree two years later, and the, you all know, behold, the red belted polypore mushroom was popping out. This is exactly the species that the timber industry and the lumber industry in their documents was trying to prevent from growing. Well, this fungus is very active in breaking down a wide assortment of toxins, anthropogenic and xeno xenobiotic toxins, including pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. And so I had a garden, and in 1984, I had two beehives, and I'm growing the garden giant mushroom in my garden. And then one day, I walk out in the morning, and I'm astonished, when I look close, I have bees that move the wood chips away, exposing the mycelium, I look really carefully, and they were sucking on my mycelium. But there's a lot of effort to move those big wood chips. And my mycelial patch was this thick. And for 40 days, from sunrise to sunset, a continuous stream of bees. I thought, this is very interesting. I looked at it carefully. I could see the little sweat droplets on the mycelium that they exposed. And they were sipping on them. I thought, that's really interesting. I published this. It was in first in Harrow Smith magazine. It's in one of my books, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms. Virtually everybody ignored me, except for one beekeeper in Ottawa. He said, well, maybe that's why bees are attracted to sawdust piles in the summertime. Now, in my garden, we had blackberry flowers. We had all sorts of roses with many, many flowering plants. But the bees, from morning to dusk for 40 days, went to my patch of mycelium and sucked it down. So, a series of articles. I read a lot. An article came out well, we, that all plants are part fungi. That's interesting. And that the... Um, that the fungicide use reduces beneficial fungi that are important for bees. Well, in bee bread in particular. And, and then a series of other articles come out. And it's not that complicated, but honey constituents contain an interesting polyphenol called p cumeric acid. p cumeric acid controls your detoxification pathways. We use it, bees use it, all animals use it. But bees only have uh, only have uh, uh, 56 uh, genes, uh, or 47 genes, for coding for p cumeric acid that, uh, for, for, I'm sorry, for cytochrome P450s that are controlled by p cumeric acid. So basically, without the fungi, you don't have p cumeric acid, the genes are turned off. So the bees are dependent upon these fungal compounds that are in de decomposing wood for their detoxification pathways. When you remove the wood, their, their detoxification pathways are turned off. There is a hyperaccumulation of toxins, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, et cetera. The bees develop malaise. They are not able to take care of themselves as well. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, there's a fungal constituent. Well, the bees also are being parasitized by mites. And mites carry viruses. 
And when there is a 7% infestation of mites in beehives, the colony collapses. Whoa. Well, there's lots of research on entomopathogenic fungi. Some of you know my well, work on this. And there's this metarhizium fungus that does not harm bees, but attacks the mites. So there's a lot of research on how can we control varroa mites that are vectoring the viruses by using this fungus. So something else that I've been very keen on. And so when Louis Schwartzberg knew of my work with insects and fungi, he says, Paul, can you help the bees? I went, you know, I had this really strange experience with bees in my garden. So I said, well, Louis, let me look into that. And I started thinking and thinking. And I love this, the brain space between sleep and awakening. And I lay in that state of semi-consciousness. And then I have this gestaltic experience of connecting the dots. And then I have this epiphany that took me 30 years. <laughs> and so we have now created myco honey coming from mycelium. And the myco honey is extremely sweet, a wide assortment of sugars and polysaccharides. Beekeepers typically use 50% sucrose solutions to feed the honeybees. The honeybees are not native to North America, but we have 4,000 native bees, and they also are dependent upon these complex sugars. So we created this myco honey, and then I approached several universities. When I contacted Washington State University, they said, please don't go to anyone else. This is too cool of an idea. <laughs> so we started doing experiments with bees. Uh, so first, we, do, we want to do a stress test. 100 bees, bees in a cage. They're given uh, extracts of the mycelium, the myco honey, uh, of different species. Uh, we have a, a 500 strains and species in our culture library. So, but I focused in on a particular group of polypore mushrooms because I knew from agaricon and from amadou that they had antiviral properties. So. We started doing this research, and then it dawned on me, wow, um, many of these polypores grow on birch trees. And so we have uh, uh, amadou, which is the very top, we have chaga, and we have reishi. Now bees go to scratch trees only of willows and birch trees and young firs, which the bears also scratch. And the red belt of polypore grows on firs, and these three other species here grow on birch trees. But that's specifically the trees the bees go to sip on the sap and to collect the resins for, for propolis. So here are our preliminary results. And this is a stress test showing the effects of the red-belted polypore uh, and, the, uh, and the amadou mushroom and being able to increase longevity. Those of you who know anything about significance factors, this is extraordinarily significant. And this ra ratio here means that the more of the bees are living, and so the worker bees can do their job, the nurse bees are not prematurely recruited. So Dr. Uh, Steve Shepard and Dr. Brander, uh, Brandon uh, uh, Taylor, who I'm working with, um, have been doing this work. And as an entomologist of 39 years of experience studying bees, I'm unaware of any reports that extend the life of worker bees more than this. So this is a very skeptical group of scientists. <laughs> so then we said, well, let's look at the viruses being vectored by the mites. And so for the first time I am showing this, this is over two weeks. The bees in captivity only li live for about four weeks. They succumb to the viruses vectored by the mites and the other absence of, the, of access to these fungal constituents that help the detoxification pathway. And feeding them our extracts compared to the sugar control, and you can see how the viral count sp skyrockets. And then at 0.1, 1%, and 10% solution, uh, the viral counts plummet. Now, so looking at this with some other species now, looking at the red reishi, which also grows on birch trees, we get a similar effect. A massive amount of viruses will, will reproduce within the bees without the exposure to the myco honey, but as the myco honey increases, there is a radical decline in the viral um, pathogen payload. How weird is this? that the same mushrooms that can limit bird flu, H5N1, herpes, also positively affect bees and being able to 
for them to control the viral burden and reduce them. I think this points to a larger picture. And looking now at the bees in captivity and the survival rate, the red ratio also, and this is significant here in this part of the lifespan, again, the worker bees are able to do their job, the nurse bees they don't have to be prematurely recruited, the colony then is better to able to survive. So a hypothesis is not necessarily based on facts. This is my hypothesis. The increase, the longevity of worker bees, the reduction of the vir viral loads, the reduction of varroa mites, and the increased year-to-year -year survival. Well, the hypothesis has now become a theory. We have confirmed that we can increase longevity. We can confirm that we reduce the viral uh, uh, payloads. We know that the varroa mites can be controlled by metarhizium fungi, and now we are going to go into thousands of beehives next fall um, to try to be able to demonstrate this uh, you know, across many states in the United States and hopefully in many countries. And as Lenny alluded to, I really believe the solutions are literally underfoot. And they're also endemic to our culture. How many of us read uh, Winnie the Pooh to our children, or some of you young people here, knew about Winnie the Pooh going to rotted logs to go after the bees? I'm mostly, I'm thrilled that I've made this discovery, and I'm also frightened. How is it today that I'm the first one to have made this discovery? We scoured the scientific literature. We had mycologists and entomologists. They've gone to hundreds of conferences. No one's ever mentioned this, even a whisper of it. Bees are attracted to rotting logs specifically for their immunological benefit. As part of their host defense of their immunity, they're just not going to a rotted log just because they want to be in a rotted log. There's species specificity factors here that can upregulate their immune system, give them a host defense antiviral shield, allow them to detoxify toxins, and they, they allow them to be better pollinators. 30% of our food is directly pollinated by bees, and 70% of our food is, is controlled by pollinators. We are we suffering a collapse of our ecosystems, but we can do something about this. And so I want to call out, and I'm proposing we be mushroomed. <laughs> I'm calling out to all of you as citizen scientists to join in a mycological revolution, to be able to go out and be able to help wild bees as well as, as the honeybee, and to be able to engage in permaculture practices to return carbon back into the soil, to build the mycelial networks, because we are far more interconnected with mycelium in nature than we even have a glimpse of being possible. So I want to then finish now with a movie that Louis Schwartzberg and I are making together, and my dear brother Louis uh, is, uh, and has put together this little two-minute clip, and I just want to uh, close with this. Mushroom mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that?
If I die trying, and but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.